Hello, everyone. My name is Janine Donnelly, Manager of Webinars for IBM Systems Magazine. And on behalf of IBM Systems Magazine, I'd like to welcome you to our presentation. We will be holding a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. You may ask a question at any time during the event by entering it into the Q&A panel. If you experience technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the Q&A panel to alert us and someone will assist you. You may download a PDF version of the slide deck. By clicking on the drop-down menu labeled Event Resources, you'll find that on the left side of your screen, and know that you can download those right from the platform without being disconnected from the webinar. Today's webinar, How to Plan for IBM I in the Cloud, is sponsored by Help System. Our featured speakers today are Ash Gidding and Tom Huntington from Help Systems and John Bradshaw from SkyTap. Tom is Executive Vice President of Technical Solutions at Help Systems and has been named an IBM champion for the last five years. He oversees business alliances and large customer relationships and ensures that Help Systems software works with other major software and hardware vendors worldwide. Ash is a pre-sales specialist at Health Systems. Ash began his career on IBM mainframe before moving into mid-range systems such as IBM i and AIX, and then Windows and Linux. He's worked for some of the largest data centers in Europe and has advised large companies around the world on ways to save costs and improve efficiencies. John Bradshaw is the principal architect for SkyTap in EMEA. He works with customers to take their traditional enterprise workloads on power into the cloud. John believes that more than the rest of the industry combined, the power community has the best opportunity for true business transformation through the cloud. So without further ado, Ash, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Janine. So here's the agenda. First things first. Uh, cloud is an umbrella term used for a number of things in the industry. So we're going to start today's session. Um, we're going to outline really what defines cloud, what cloud services there are, and what the subtle differences are really between those cloud services. We'll then look at how to identify uh, workloads best suited for cloud. Can you run everything in the cloud? We'll also look at some sizing techniques here so that you don't pay for what you're not using always key. Next, we'll look at how to get or how best to get IBM data into the cloud. And this is, this is a two-pronged approach, so both as a, as a one-off and then once it's there to keep it in sync with your, your on-prem environment until such a point in time where you've migrated to cloud, you're happy with it, and you're ready to power that, that on-prem box off. We'll then highlight some of the areas of data security and how to avoid those, um, those areas tripping you up. Before finally, we'll talk about licensing considerations when you migrate to cloud. So moving to cloud isn't just a, an infrastructure refresh exercise. What you're doing is you're re-engineering the, the underlying architecture, potentially of your core business applications. But when done right, it can help you realize a huge number of benefits attributed to the cloud. But what defines a cloud? So the National Institute of Standards and Technology have defined five essential characteristics of cloud computing. On-demand service, broad network access, resource pooling, rapid elasticity or expansion, and measured service. Something John mentioned to me uh, a few weeks ago was that if you need to raise a ticket to get something changed, then it can't be considered a cloud service. Is that right, John? Yes, absolutely. You need to be in control. You need to be able to make the changes you want to make when you want to make them. Fantastic. Nice and easy. So let's have a, a little look. John, do you want to talk us through some of the, the common cloud services we have here and, and really what sets these three services apart? 
<clears throat> yes, absolutely. So um, if we start with infrastructure as a service, this is what uh, most people are, are most familiar with. That is the ability to um, effectively rent a virtual machine or an LPAR for a period of time. And that tends to include your networking, storage, uh, and compute requirements. As you start to move up the value chain, you get to something called platform as a service. So that tends to be a managed database that you're consuming. So um, in, in AWS terms, that could be uh, RDF, in Azure, Cosmos DB, and there are a handful of others. And then the final iteration is software as a service. And, and that's um, where you're renting access to a, a software platform. Um, typically, that, that tends to be Salesforce or Microsoft Dynamics or Teams, those sorts of applications that you use on a day-to-day -day basis that you don't own, you don't manage the, the use of them, you don't have to care and feed for them. You simply configure them to suit your particular needs. Fantastic, John. Nice and nice and clear to, to get us started. Now, this uh, this slide here, this is one of the questions that help systems ask as part of their their popular annual uh, IBM My Marketplace survey. And what we saw was there was a six percent shift in the respondents that have an element of IBM I running in the cloud this year compared to last year. Six percent more had them. And if the conversations I have regularly with customers is anything to go by, I fully expect more and more workloads going to the cloud over the coming year. Um, watch out for the, the next Marketplace survey hitting webinars and, uh, and blogs and, and the like in early 21, 2021. Yeah, I'd like uh, to ask a survey and find out why you're here today and are you using cloud technology yourself? What part does cloud play in your current IBM I environment? And you can select more than one because we realize that you might have, um, I guess, your foot in multiple points at this point in time with the cloud. We run production workloads in the cloud already. We run development, test workloads in the cloud. We're fact-finding. We're only using IBM I on-prem. Now, we find as we discuss with customers going to the cloud with the IBM I platform that uh, sometimes, you know, we – we, we need to, we think production right away, but we need to step back from that and start with test and development. And then probably the next thing people move towards is uh, HA in the cloud or DR as a service, whatever you want to call it. And then finally moving production there is kind of a common, especially if you're a, a larger customer and you're, you're looking at this uh, uh, technology uh, to move in the cloud. Certainly it is a progression or a journey to the cloud. So let's see, Janine, looks like we've gotten a quite a few uh, responses already here. So um, I'm seeing, yeah. Should I go ahead ready? and launch these results? Yeah, let's go yeah. ahead and send these out to the audience. Thank you. Awesome. It looks like uh, we run production and workloads is, is at 9%. Um, we run development so far, uh, almost 11% there. We're just fact finding uh, 65%. And we're, we're only using IBM I on-prem, so nearly 80% uh, sitting there at 78.5%. Um, you know, and, and don't be shocked. Uh, I look at moving to the cloud, and we'll talk more about this, as a little different issue for IBM I customers versus, you know, Windows or, or Linux or some of those other reasons why people go to the cloud with, with this platform. So let's see, back over to the slides here. Fantastic. Thank you, Tom. Let's just move this slide on. So how to identify workloads best suited to cloud? Well, with IBM I home to some critical applications for those in finance, manufacturing, uh, distribution, logistics, healthcare, gaming, pretty much everything, isn't it? Moving these critical, highly transactional workloads to anywhere other than on-prem was unthinkable even a few years ago, to be honest. Now, I'm a huge fan of cloud, but it would be a big mistake to think that cloud is just another data center and that traditional ways of working that we've been doing uh, for year after year um, are all transferable to cloud. Some are, some maybe not so much. Moving applications to cloud requires planning, but if done right, um, they enable you to offer a better user experience, 
allow you to scale with flexibility, manage costs, and provide you with the opportunity to innovate and modernize faster than ever before. If you think that moving workloads to the cloud is just running your IBM I application in someone else's data center, you're definitely missing the opportunities that the cloud provides. John, talk to us about SkyTap and IBM I. How long have you had IBM I as an option in the cloud, please? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> we launched that uh, last year, um, around about May, May June time. Um, and we've got um, many um, multiples of dozens of customers actively using that now for both production um, and development and test workloads. Okay. And are any industries moving quicker or slower than others? Well, it's, it's really quite fascinating, and it, it, it depends on what region you're talking about. So um, whilst I, I focus mainly on, on EMEA, um, I've noticed that in the, the Far East, so Singapore, those sorts of um, areas, lots of financial applications, lots of um, banking customers are, are bringing workloads over to us uh, as, as part of that. But if I look at, say, the, the UK or um, uh, Europe more widely, it tends to be retailers um, and some manufacturers as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a real mix of, of, uh, of users. Okay, that's interesting. So let's have a, let's have a little, little look at some good candidates for going to the cloud. Now, public, uh, public cloud services were really born as a result of the, the retail sector having peaks and troughs in business. I think January and February for travel and, and holiday companies, Others have peaks in the build-up to Christmas, Black Friday, seasonal sales. Without cloud, you have no choice but to ensure that you have sufficient capacity available within your enterprise, despite the fact that for the majority of the year, you're not going to need that additional headroom. If you're looking, at, looking for a candidate to move to the cloud, take a step back, look at your business and work out what it really is, and probably more importantly, what it isn't. Applications like payroll, email, although critical for companies, but unless you run uh, services where you provide payroll or email services, there's no real value by you running those on-prem, no real value whatsoever. And as we go down this list, maybe applications where you're not sure of the correct architecture, deploying to the cloud allows you the flexibility to change things very quickly and on the fly. They don't need to live on the cloud forever. And you can maybe just use the cloud as a as a try before you buy. Um, I, I do see a, a, a trend in the people I talk to. Before you embark on a cloud initiative, maybe it makes sense to deploy some dev or some test workloads to begin with. There's definitely less risk with these, less visibility in the business if you were to have any problems or um, experience uh, you know anything at all. Now with number five those applications with uh, fewest regulatory restrictions. We're going to cover this in more depth later, but there's things like uh, data sovereignty, data localization, and data residency restrictions to consider. Uh, John, does this sound about right, this list? Um, I guess IBM I was probably quite late to the game with regards to, with regards to cloud. So has it followed a, a similar yeah. path to other platforms? Yes, indeed it has. So um, you were very right to point out about, um, about having a play. Um, the, the main way that cloud has become so embedded in, in lots of customers is because people have needed a little bit of extra capacity to do something or try something or, or build something novel that, that gives them a competitive edge against um, uh, the rest of the market. Cloud let people dip their toe in with a credit card without risking the entire business. Um, and that's what we're starting to see here with, with I as well. So maybe there's a better way of, of delivering development and tests rather than large solutions and systems that are deployed for many years. Why don't we take a small one, have a play with it, see if that fits into our, into our way of working. But absolutely, all, all of the numbers, uh, sorry, all of the, the ones you pointed out there are, are exactly right. Excellent, good, thank you. Now, originally it was only those with uh, deep pockets that had high availability, think banks, maybe financial institutions. These days, HA is, is very much mainstream. And again, going back to the help system survey, 58% of respondents said they have some form of HA. 
In recent times, companies have started using cloud for HA, both power HA and logical replication using remote journals. Remote journals are available in, uh, in cloud solutions. Uh, DevOps, having the ability to quickly spin up a, a cloud LPAR, as John is going to demonstrate uh, shortly, snapshot it, conduct some tests, revert back to that snapshot again and again, are really worth their weight in gold. Whether we like it or not, there are fewer and fewer IBM skilled professionals um, working. And moving to the cloud can help alleviate some, not all, some of those worries. As some of the things you don't need to worry about are VIOS. That's a challenge for many. Many use business partners to, to build their VIOS partitions. Don't really understand it. And the HMC. You don't really need to worry about, uh, about that at all. Or maybe you're at a point where you need to spend on hardware or software or even a data center. Now, cloud isn't a magic wand here, but if used correctly, it can certainly eliminate much of this. And I like this next one, align expenditure with revenue. John, this, this was one of yours. Can, can you talk what, what you meant about that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at the cloud model, and this is the one that um, uh, Azure and AWS have been um, positioning for, for many years, is um, why aren't you scaling your workload to meet your demand? So if you have 10 more customers, then it makes sense to increase or be able to increase your local capacity by whatever factor makes that 10 additional customers supported. So instead of having those large capital spends at the beginning and then trying to pay them back over a period of time and hoping that your customer demand uh, allows you to meet that obligation, instead you're taking the bare minimum necessary to operate the service and simply scaling it up and down as your customer flows uh, uh, ebb and wave. So it, it drives your spend aligned with your income. It makes perfect sense when you say that, isn't it? It really does. Um, increased competitive advantage, again, by moving some of the vanilla applications to cloud enables you to really focus on what your core business and applications are and the ones that can make a real difference to your bottom line. For production workloads, catering for, for variable workloads is probably still the most common reason for cloud adoption. And as we go down the list, board directive, maybe not so much, not so common now, but the cloud first directive um, is still there. We still see that, it's still valid. And then of course, modernization. It allows you to move to new hardware and or new software releases quickly and without the need to go cap in hand to the business for CapEx expenditure. Again, mixing cloud and on-prem in a hybrid type environment might work well for you as well. Anything I've missed there, John? No, I don't think so. I think you've covered that perfectly. Fantastic. Over to you, Tom. Well, thank you, Ash and John. And so as we continue down this road, you know, how, how, do, I, how do I know I'm, I may need to plan differently when I look at uh, what's going to run in the cloud? And should I be thinking about uh, my, you know, my workloads? Uh, do I... Do I forgo things like security, as Ash is going to talk about later, and somebody else is doing that, and all things that need to be talked about? Um, can I still run performance collections? So as far as performance go, do I still need to worry about that? And, uh, of course, uh, in our mind, yes, of course, you still need to look at your resource consumptions and have an understanding of what you're consuming because certainly – John and his team will just keep adding processors for you and memory if you'd like, but uh, if you're the customer, you might want to still understand your resource consumption so it's being handled properly. What happens then if you do start to use more resources than expected? What, you know, what were your, your plans for growth? Now, as we'll walk through some charts here, the nice thing you will see is that you can, um, you know, you don't have to plan for the next three years when you go to the cloud from a perspective of actual hardware consumption. You can plan for the next three months, next month, next six months, depending upon what your um, needs are. So then what happens if you if more, I move to the cloud and I have a performance issue? Whose responsibility is it and who's going to help you out with that and troubleshooting those things? Because what you have to remember 
that you could very well in the case of cloud and more than likely be sharing a server with other people that are consuming performance memory processor, those kinds of things. And of course, what does my contract say for all these things? Uh, it is important. Um, unfortunately, you have to have legal part of this, but you are signing a contract and you need to understand who's responsible for what, um, who's doing things like, you know, just change control, go away. Yes, probably for some things, but Obviously, for updating your application, those are still your responsibilities if you're going to make changes there. Um, but changing the hardware, obviously, that's being done by your service provider. But then again, you depending upon how big your environment is, you might want to be even plugged into that process so that you're aware of what things are going on. And do you lose control? You know, is your team willing to forgo certain things, not be responsible for PTFs, not be responsible for updating the operating system or working with the BIOS. If you're okay with that, then certainly you are going to lose control of those things. Um, but there are other things that you still need to be responsible. As I said, your change control is not going to go away. Um, you should still be looking at your performance. You're probably going to own automation because uh, unless there's another set of services with this, um, those are going to be your responsibilities. So the other thing you need to think about is your workload and how it is being consumed. And, um, you know, having a good footprint and understanding the properties of your workload before you go to the cloud is really a good idea because then you can kind of plan for processor consumption, for example. Maybe you're very highly seasonal business and, um, you know, your spring or your fall or during the peak of retail is when you see a peak in the consumption of your systems, you can plan for that. Um, but you need, you know, you need, you need to plan for that because uh, you can have extra charges or surcharges depending upon, again, what your contract says. If, if you add a processor, is it at the same, you know, cost level as, as before? So how do you identify workloads best suited for the cloud? Um, you know, when's peak and when is in peak? Uh, performance collection doesn't go away. And if you don't know, Help Systems does have the Performance Navigator product, which is often used for sizing and planning for capacity for on-premise. Well, we say that doesn't go away. As a matter of fact, a tool like this is almost even more important to understand your footprint and your consumption and your workloads before you go to the cloud is really, you know, you know important. And because otherwise uh, it's, you know, we're going to the cloud, but we really don't know what we're going to be using. So again, um, being able to identify these peak loads, uh, workloads as far as processor goes, as far as um, memory and uh, those things are important. So with this technology we provide, you with a overview of your resource consumption. And um, you can use uh, these reports to see, you know, what are your disk I.O. rates, your average response time for that? What's your average response time for individual uh, end users? Because you still probably have 5250 workload when you're talking about IBM I. And knowing where you're at before you go to the cloud is really going to help you as you benchmark your first um, applications that you're putting in the cloud to understand where you're at. Again, if you don't know, you're going to go to the cloud and just say, boy, I think things are faster or I think things are slower. I just don't know because you didn't have the history from before. So here's an example that we use to help under people understand this. So if you look at your business today and you want to identify your work, work workloads best suited for the cloud, you first have to understand what you've been doing on-premise. So typically when you're doing an on-premise sizing activity, you're looking at sizing your next IBM I server for probably a three or five year purchase. So um, in this case here, we were planning for 51% growth because we didn't want to come back to management every year for another capital outload, we want to be able to plan. And, and so for, in order to do that, um, this partition, we want to have 23 cores, 
available for us as we go over the next three years. Obviously, you could add in more cores on the fly, but then again, you have to go back to IBM and ask, you know, and ask management for more money. Versus if you look at, you are going to move to the cloud. So if we look at this pre previous example, we have 23 cores. And now what we're saying, hey, we want to plan for now. We want to plan for the next three months or next year. And instead of having to have 23 cores, we have 16 because there's nothing wrong with running your peak workload in the 90s versus on this example here, if we were to take this workload, we're running right around the 60s. Um, there's nothing wrong with, with, you, with you know, maxing out that uh, CPU on the system. Um, and so with this, we have a 5% growth that we're planning on over three years. But you know, as you get into year two and year three, you may need to have 23 cores, but you're only paying for 16 the first year and maybe um, you know, 18 the second year and then 23 in the third year. That's kind of the approach that we, we see and we can help customers with that with Performance Navigator. So Ash, yeah. over to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it's all about understanding your workload, isn't it? And, and identifying what a real peak is. And maybe it's a, a badly formed query, a one-off. Um, maybe you don't need to cater for that. It's, it's, it's just getting your hands on your, that data and, and knowing what your workload really is. Um, but Performance Navigator isn't just about capacity planning. It also has some other elements as well, such as historical performance analysis, which is a set of um, uh, set of reports known as power analytics, and they help you ensure that critical performance metrics, including traditional CPU disk and memory, are safely within best practice guidelines. You can set, sorry, it's shipped with best practice guidelines. You can overwrite them and set your own. It also comes with a problem determination element as well. Whether it's a, a current system slowdown or you need to understand what happened to the system at 2 a.m. this morning while you were asleep. You can use Performance Navigator to get a fast and thorough problem determination summary in under two minutes. And the, the great thing with this is it uses collection services data. And collection services data is running, it's turned on your eye by default. So unless you've turned it off, it's, it's running. Um, so little to no overhead. It also collects and condenses that performance collection data. So you can collect over a year's worth and it's less than 70 meg. And one thing just to let you know about is there are two free graphs with it, CPU by priority and disk space utilization. You can download the product today and use those graphs free of charge without a license. Um, one final thing to mention directly on the product is um, if you don't have the appetite to purchase the product, and some people don't, you can still in install the product and you can use it to send your data to us for analysis. We have a, a team working in the services division that, um, that love analyzing performance data and customer data. So it's a real good fit for those that are thinking about moving to the cloud, but don't really understand what their workload looks like. Yeah, Ash, and I'll, I'll add to that too, that that's a um, tool that also works on AIX and Linux on power. So you can use this not only for IBM I, of course your BIOS partition and then AIX and Linux. So we do have customers where we provide a entire enterprise report across AIX, Linux, and IBM I. Probably more AIX than IBM I, right? Yeah, good point, across the whole frame. Um, so I think it's mm -hmm. quite unique in the marketplace. Um, and yeah. this, kind of, um, this kind of came left field, Tom, uh, a month or so ago, didn't it? Um, IBM announced that it the did. Uh, performance management uh, uh, for power systems has, uh, has, has stopped. It's been withdrawn. Um, Performance Navigator, Help Systems Performance Navigator, is a very good fit for that. Um, we're, we use the same data. We use that collection services data. So if you were reliant on PM400, um, this is a good fit for that. And we'd happily show you what we can do in that particular area. 
Yeah, and probably the difference, too, is that we keep the data on premise if you're doing the reporting and stuff. But certainly you could talk to our team and we could do the, you know, build the graphs and stuff for you. You just got to send us, you know, the data. Um, but, you know, this is something that was discontinued for IBM I, AIX um, power in September. It was a service and I guess not technically a software offering. And we got a webinar next week to talk more about that. So look that up on the Help Systems website, and we'll inform you further on how we can replace that. Yeah. Now, John's going to shortly show us um, how easy it is to provision an IBM uh, LPAR in the cloud. But John, as a, I guess as a precursor to that, many of us are used mm. to uh, Power VM, which um, which allows us to obviously deploy partitions quickly and without pain. Does cloud complicate this? Are we using PowerVM under the covers, or will you be? No, what it actually does is it abstracts this from you. So you don't need to run um, or, or, or manage PowerVM in, in any way, shape, or form. And yes, uh, under the covers, SkyCap um, is running PowerVM uh, alongside an x86 hypervisor as well. Okay. So. Um, with a with a platform like SkyTap, you can choose your um, uh, choose how you deploy your 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 VMs or your LPAR. Fantastic, and I, I guess you're going to show us anyway. But what are your choices in terms of processes? Can you have shared, dedicated, capped, uncapped? Um, what are the choices? So you uh, at the moment you can um, choose between uh, capped or uncapped, depending on the operating system. So uh, with AIX it's uncapped, but with IBM I, it's capped at the moment. And there are plans to, uh, to help expand the, the range of choices uh, over the next few, uh, few quarters. Okay, and what about disk? Um, I would assume it's all external disk, but are there any choices there? So um, on SkyTap, it, it, yes, it does present uh, um, as vSCSI or, or, or external disk, um, but it, it's all SSDs, so we don't have any spinny disk whatsoever in, in the platform. Um, and you can choose the sizing. So you can go from a three gig LUN to a four terabyte LUN uh, and multiples thereof based on your particular use case and, uh, and need. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I guess we should let you uh show us what it's all about john so hopefully you can all see my screen so i thought i'd uh, i'd start by just showing you a uh, the way that customers would interact with a platform like skytap so um we have two direct uh, or two main mechanisms or ways of, of engaging with us we are on the microsoft azure marketplace so if you are an organization that's already gone down part of your cloud journey you can just simply click on on our uh, our offering hit get it now, and then uh, uh, click another continue button, and bang, you're straight into, into SkyTap and starting to consume it uh, just like you would anything else on Azure. So by the minute, base billing. We're also on the IBM cloud as well, and, uh, and the same, same approach applies here. You click a couple of buttons and you get access into the SkyTap platform. So this is what you'd see as a, as a user of SkyTap. Um, in this case, I happen to be logged in as an administrator, so I can see everything my team has done in the last uh, calendar month in terms of spend. Uh, and I can keep an eye on that, and I can set limits, um, as you'd expect in a, in a cloud service. I can also quickly interact with systems. So if I want to start a partition I've been working on recently, I can just press the play button here, and it will begin to, uh, to boot up, or IPL, and, uh, and away I go. So um, you probably want to see a, uh, a partition provision. So we can just go to new environment. I can type in IBM I. I happen to be based in London, so I'm going to use the region that's low, uh, nearest to me, but just for convenience more than anything else. So I've selected the, the version I want, so I'm, I'm going with 7.4, but you could go to 7.2 or 3. Hit create environment. This process takes about 40 seconds, give or take. Um, and in the background, what it's doing is it's uh, allocating the storage. It's um, copying a template across so that you can use it. And it's provisioning the networking and all the other bits and pieces in the background to, to enable you to use it. So that's provision. It's ready to go. I could press play now, and it will start to IPL. Um, obviously, with two gigs of RAM, that 
going to take a little while. So uh, I can tune that up if I want to. So uh, let's say 32 gigs of RAM. Um, and I'm going to give it whoops, four processors as well. Um, I can choose to add more disk to it. So if I, if I want to increase um, the, the, uh, the number of arms I can, if I uh, want to put in new ASPs and, and build them with different sizes, absolutely fine as well. And you can then choose how, how some of this is uh, built to you as well as um, the way you might want to boot it. So if you're doing a migration, perhaps you want to go into uh, manual D mode in order to load, uh, load a CD and, and start that process. But I will just press save. Now, that's made the change instantly. Uh, you can see here the CPWs uh, that I've made available to it um, and the entitled capacity. And I can reduce the EC if I needed to for, say, licensing reasons. So if I go back to the screen and I can press play. So this will take a couple of minutes. It's going in the background and looking for the least loaded um, frame in our state in EMEA um, and deciding where to place the LPAR. Once it's made that decision, it starts to IPL it. So it does take a few minutes, but it's, uh, it, it, we find that customers say it's an awful lot quicker than uh, how long it takes to IPL a machine um, back on prem. So we'll leave this ticking over John. now. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was just going to, I can agree with that. And what I do like is you get the SRC codes. As soon as it starts IPL in, you get the SRC codes mm. up in that um, that little dialog box. Yes, just at the bottom here. And um, from the from the dashboard you saw, which it will take a while to, to populate. So I can show you from a, from a different machine. Uh, and of course, I'm using too much. So um, it, it will show you the... Um, the ability to drop straight into uh, DST mode. So if I wanted to, because you don't have access to the HMC or, or other bits and pieces, I can press the um, dedicated service tools button there and it will go ahead and um, throw me into DST so I can start making configuration changes uh, on that LPAR. So I will just go back to it. And, and so after a couple of minutes, this is what you'd see. You'd be presented with it. Um, I can run all the commands I might want to, to use on-prem. Um, and it, it's, this is DSP01, so it's as if you're sat in front of it, to be honest. Um, you can then start layering on your, your license programs or any other bits and pieces you might want. Um, and uh, that's, that's really it. That's running an LPAR in the cloud for want of a better term. So, um, I'll hand it back to, to you, Ash. Wonderful, wonderful. And I think Tom's going to take over now. Yeah. So once we've, once we've partitioned a, a partition in the cloud, we're going to talk about how to get that data from A to B. So over to you, Tom. Thank you. So let's do that. Let's talk about migrating to the cloud, which is, you know, really, really the question. Um, there's a lot of data on IBMI. It's known as the system of records. And obviously, with that comes a lot of structured data, but we even have unstructured data because people are storing things in the IFS. So obviously, kind of more the traditional option one, which is do that full save and, and restore, um, which uh, results in outage and obviously a period of time before uh, and, and potentially even RPO if you if you um, issues if you don't save that data and then stop doing production and then move which is not an option for a lot of us because you know IBMI is just that system sits in the background people depend on it right option two would be full save plus doing those differential incremental uh, saves and sending up just the incremental, again, saving you a little time because you're not doing full uh, restores of everything. Or as we say at option three, and probably the best option is a form of logical replication. So uh, those are, are kind of the main options here. And kind of to introduce maybe the, the best of both worlds is to uh, think about full systems restore, or full system save rather, with a 
Save 21, BRMS, Robot HA, or Robot Save rather, something like that, and being able to um, to uh, save those and use some technology called DataBox, which is something that uh, the team at SkyTap uses to move the data up um, and a good good large uh, data that's being done in um, over the internet. So. John, I'm not sure if you want to talk a little bit about the data box for us because you got a, a lot more experience on that than I do. Yes, absolutely. So um, the, the data box is, is basically um, uh, it's a bit like a small suitcase, um, but it weighs about 60 pounds. Um, so you're not going to be hoofing that over your shoulder. Um, but it, it stores mm. around 100 terabytes of, uh, of data. It's uh, highly encrypted. Uh, Azure will ship you one to your office and you can plug it in uh, and use an NFS mount or an SMB mount, how, whatever makes most sense for you. And IBM have an equivalent uh, of that product as well. Um, and if you have even bigger requirements, they, they have a, a one petabyte data box trolley, um, which I mean, must weigh, must weigh a quarter of a ton, but, uh, but that can be shipped to you as well and, and can be part of an even bigger migration. But then the idea, and as you use the data box, take that point in time, um, save, get your data up into the cloud, and then from there, we we need to then think about um, moving the data to the cloud. So the full system combined with an incremental different saves is, you know, it's a little little risky because um, you have the smaller outage required, but still you really don't have that in sync, and it is still a slow process to use you know, backups to get your data to the cloud. Whereas um, with logical replication, you really are looking at no or little outage, um, depending upon if we have to get a sync of your library, there still is a save process that runs when you're talking data box and you know, depending upon environments, I, I shouldn't say no outage, um, save all active will certainly work but not always for everybody. So that's why there has to be a little bit of disclaimer on that. Um, the transactions are then kept up to date while your uh, data is in the cloud um, and before you actually switch over, uh, your data is being kept with on-premise into the cloud. It's also you know, valuable uh, safety net uh, security-wise. It's very secure. Uh, allows for testing of your target environment too because Obviously, if you're doing a, a save 21 and you're saying, hey, we're going to move everything over the weekend to the cloud, there's not a lot of like time to make sure that the application's up and running before you put the users on there. Because most of, us, most of us on IBMI don't really have that luxury of big downtime windows, right? Um, and this is really going to be used for your HA or DR in the cloud when we use a software replication. So it's going to look, uh, software replication is really no different in, to a certain extent when we look at from on-prem to cloud. We're still going to be local journal, remote journal technology with an apply process that's running in the cloud. So the big connection here is that we have to be able to talk securely between on-prem and cloud and making sure that uh, that connection is in place. And, and I'll show you that in a bit. So what we think, if you look at this and we combine um, the uh, data box technology that John was just talking about with the uh, robot HA in the cloud, um, then what we have is really a great combination here. Point in time, ability to send a lot of data um, and or um, the ability to uh, send things up uh, via uh, just do an HA. And, and John and I were talking the other day, and I think, John, you said that, it, you know, in less than four hours, you could transfer without the data box about a terabyte of data uh, to your cloud. Is, is that kind of a safe estimate on that? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Yeah. So so that that's still an option. You don't have to have this data box technology. I don't want you to walk away with, oh, gosh, I have to have a data box in order to move my data to the cloud, you certainly don't. You could just go into your logical replication software, add a new library to the rule, and send that library up through the dedicated uh, gigabit uh, line that uh, SkyTap provides for you. Okay, so now off to the live demo for you. Let's uh, show you some things here. So 
I have to go share my screen. This might take just a little bit. Ash, anything to update them on while I am loading up my screen? Yeah, I mean, I, what Tom's going to show is going to show you um, real-time data replication to the cloud. So we have an on-prem box. We've spun up a partition in uh, in SkyTap, and uh, you'll see how easy it is. Really, it's uh, it's nothing scary at all. And just while you're getting there, um, replacing PM400, 4th of November, so week after next. The 4th of November. Thank you. And I think you can see my screen now. Is that true? Yes, indeed. Yes. You're seeing the sky tap, kind of similar look to what uh, John was showing earlier. I just wanted to show this again just to show you that we have, you know, a, a server. This is our main target server that we're going to target from our on-prem into the cloud. And we have a couple other uh, instances of IBMI, and we have Robot HA technically running between the three of these, and I can be replicating data between them. Because once you're in the cloud, if you get rid of the on-premise data center completely, we still are in a firm believer you still need a form of data replication up in the cloud. But that's what we're showing you here. And then we also have a Windows server over here, so I can click on that. I can just click into any one of these. So if I have a GUI for my application, for instance, I'm using Robot Schedule, and I want to see my jobs I have up there, you know, I can do that all from the SkyTap uh, interface. If I click back here, I can go back and I can view all my VMs. So fairly easy to navigate, um, and, or if I want, I can go right to the 5250 session, right? So those are all fun things that you can do with the interface. Um, I also have two 5250 sessions. Now I did things a little differently. Um, I have my on-prem system called Able. I have my in-the-cloud server called IBM i7.3 v4. And what I've done is Telnet, and we have certainly different colors for them. If I come in uh, to Robot HA from the RBO menu, um, I can see I have rules in place already from my IBM I on-premise system. So really what I have going on here is I'm sending data uh, the same library from on-prem, I'm sending that to my target HA on-prem, but then I'm also sending it to IBM i 73 v 4 in the cloud and using journaling and, you know, I can drill in and look at all my journal attributes and all those things. Okay? Ash, still seeing this okay? Yes, indeed, Tom. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, obviously, sometimes there's proof in the, the pudding. Let's uh, use our uh, database utility called EasyView. Um, basically, easy view is uh, like DFU, but a bit more powerful. We'll leave it at that. Uh, that uh, you can change and you can have audited data while you're changing things. So here I'm just going to go change some raw data. Um, and uh, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll put uh, just SkyTap in here um, and hit Enter. And we'll notice over here it says October 21st. I haven't changed the record yet, so let me hit Enter here. I simply do an enter over here, and it's changed our data. That happens so quickly. Um, I'll say see, see you next week on the Power M, uh, PM uh, webinar that we're doing. And there you go. So that's just data changing. So this is on-prem. This is in the cloud. Um, and, of course, you know, obviously, Somebody's got to still create rules and all those kinds of things, right? So let's just say we want to add a new library, and I want to send it up into the cloud. I press F6. I enter in HA demo. Um, and actually, I have to press F4. Well, I don't have to, but it's easier just to select the system. IBM i7.3 v4 is my cloud server. And um, underneath the covers, uh, Robot HA is going to create all the local and remote journals as it talks to the other system. And if we go over here and I type in HA demo for libraries, we'll see we just have these two libraries right now. So it's talking, and um, as soon as it gets done communicating from our on-prem to the cloud, it will turn around and allow us to uh, have that new rule out there. So here's our new rule for this particular library right there. Notice it hasn't been synced yet. And what we mean by that is it's not being actively journaled yet because we haven't sent it to the target because if I come over here and press F5, it's still not there. I can take option eight to sync it and hit enter. 
And what that does is it spits off basically a background job. It's going to save the library, HA Demo 2, and it's going to send it up to my target. Now, I'm not sure with the cloud here, it takes just a little longer. Um, so let's do this. Let's let that run. Oh, there it is. All right. Now, as we said, we, we can expect that, you know, probably less than four hours, more like three hours, we could send up a full terabyte, which will work for some of you out there. Um, obviously, it doesn't work for everybody. And then, of course, here's our library, and we have objects in it. Now, the other aspect of Robot HA is we do have a nice dashboard in the Insight technology that you can use to, to monitor your uh, HA environments. And here I'm showing my on-prem and my uh, system at SkyTap. I'm showing them up and running, and everything green is working great. And, of course, then we also have Power HA tied. So enough screen sharing here, and back over to you, I believe, Ash, to uh, move us forward. Yes, thank you, Tom. Uh, nice to see uh, how easy it is. Now, some people are opposed to cloud because of the fact they, they lose an element of control. They can no longer touch and feel their system. So let's step through this to hopefully help a little bit more comfortable. Now, security is definitely a concern whether it's on-prem, whether it's in the cloud. Um, as internal and external security threats continue to make the headlines almost on a daily basis, we can't help but think same mistakes, different year. And this slide here, another health systems marketplace slide, this is at 77% security, um, up 8% on the previous year. And I'll highlight here that security is always the top concern. Some of the others move around slightly, but some of the, um, but it's always top concern. IBM continues to talk about the cloud ecosystem, and as you move applications to the cloud, it's critical to remember that all security precautions still apply. Another challenge, probably bigger for IBM I, is the ongoing concern over dwindling IBM I skill sets as talent reaches retirement age. And here's an interesting slide here. In gray, we, uh, we see the security concerns. So this is a, a marketplace survey slide that covers the last five years. So gray is security concerns, and blue is skills concern. Over the last five years, security has never been higher. Skills has been a concern and is a concern for, for half the respondents. Tom, this is, uh, this is your baby, the marketplace uh, survey. Any, anything to add here? Yeah, I think, you know, when we look at IBMI, it's really more of the skills challenge and the staff to continue to manage the system is more of the driving force versus IBMI itself as being an uncontrollable platform. Because as we know in the survey, you don't need a lot of admins to run IBMI, but the problem is because people have cut back and cut back on that talent, it certainly has become one of the reasons why people move to the cloud for IBMI or are looking to do that. Perfect. Now, I think data security can really be split into two distinct areas. Partition security, this is relevant, relevant whether your partition is in the cloud or even on-prem, and regulatory restrictions relevant to any platform being in the cloud, not just IBMI. So let's, let's dig a little bit deeper on these. So we'll start with partition uh, security. To protect your partitions, wherever they are, you should look to implement a, a minimum of, bear with me, here we go, uh, these elements really. So perimeter access control, there are solutions out there that allow you to control who can access what data via what agreed interface whether it's 5250, FTP, ODBC, et cetera, and more importantly, allows you to block what isn't allowed. So you get valuable visibility and the ability to block. Also, the native virus protection. You might think that's a strange thing on IBM I, but native virus protection identifies malware, trojans, worms, et cetera, and removes it before it does any damage. Now, the danger here is not that it would be executed on IBM I, but in that it can hide in the IFS, which can then be accessed via other machines, via map drives and shares, etc. 
It's also good practice to limit the authority that sysadmins, such as ourselves, and developers have on the system via a privileged access management system that allows them to swap profiles to one with elevated privileges while all the time recording keystrokes and the screens accessed. Incredibly powerful. And then, of course, native encryption, so that when data and where data is stored and written to file, it's automatically encrypted. When it's read, a check is performed to see whether users are authorized to full, to partial, or even for, or to no access. And that's based on user, uh, user group, or group user, or supplementary profiles. And here's help systems uh, data security solutions just on IBM I. So we've leveraged our experience in the security industry to build what's a portfolio of powerful security solutions. If you don't know how to secure or don't know how secure you are today, reach out to us or use the link towards the end of today's presentation to run what we call a security scan right in the, uh, uh, in the middle at the bottom there. It's free, it's non-intrusive, and it gives you something tangible in the form of a PDF that illustrates clearly really how, secu how secure your system is today. And this is what, uh, what the security scan really looks like, really. This is, the, this is the output. It's six main areas, admin privileges, public authority, network access, FTP access, system security, user security, system auditing. It's all traffic light based. And for me, it answers the question, how do you know what you don't know? And I think the number one security takeaway from today Eve, is to run this, to download this and run this, even if it's just to validate that you're all green. So let's look, have a little look at uh, regular restrictions. Do you have any applications with, uh, with no or little customer-related data? These applications are great candidates for migrating to cloud, as you're likely to suffer least regulatory restriction and resistance. Uh, personal data can be subject to a number of regulatory controls, including data residency, data sovereignty, and data localization. So data residency relates to where a business states that their data is stored. This residency is often governed by a company's desire to take advantage of maybe more financial tax advantageous jurisdictions somewhere. Uh, data sovereignty is somewhat more expansive than residency. It states that the data is also subject to the laws and governments within the, uh, within the country it's, it's collected. And then data localization, often thought to be the strictest of the three, states that data records must remain within the geographical borders that they were created in. John, I, I guess this often, this often comes down to the regions that cloud, uh, cloud providers offer. So can you talk to us about the, the regional options in uh, SkyTap, please? Yes, absolutely. So uh, it, SkyTap has, with uh, IBM, um, locations in Toronto, um, two or three locations across the US, London, um, which we refer to as EMEA, um, and then there are some plans for, for wider rollout. Uh, in our Azure uh, regions, we are already deployed in East US, which is um, Ashburn, Virginia. Um, we are um, in the middle of deploying the kit for Amsterdam, um, Singapore, and South Central US. Um, so those are the, the, the current locations that, that we have. Um, one of the nice features is you can move these workloads between different regions as your um, business needs dictate. So if you start in East US, you can just lift and shift everything with two clicks into, say, Amsterdam, for example. Excellent. So over, over All right. To, uh, yeah, let's talk about, about uh, licensing here rather quickly. Um, you know, and, and when you think about your licensing, one of the things you need to realize is the hardware maintenance on the SWAMA now is going to be covered by SkyTap and their group, and that's kind of built into your subscription, your rental charge as you add processors, et cetera. They're going to build that out for you. Um, as far as evaluating other license considerations. Of course, your hardware maintenance in SWAMA goes away then, 
Um, why is that? Okay, sorry. Uh, but then we have to think about our vendor pricing models. You know, every vendor may be a little different. We got user-based pricing. We have pricing by partition, pricing, pricing by number of processors, and just a variety of things in the IBM world, not, you know, outside of the hardware and the operating system, you have these other vendor pricing models. And then, of course, um, things can be done differently depending upon whether it's uh, DR, test, HA. I know at Help Systems we do, you know, 50% off for HA target DR type environments, but then we also have a very generous 60-day free usage of the software for, for testing those kinds of things on an annual basis too, which can fit into your scenario. So licensing, certainly I'd love to talk more about it, but we're kind of running out of time. From a high level perspective, you know, Help Systems does security and automation software for customers, uh, not only on IBM I, but also in the cloud. And, um, and then of course, SkyTap, uh, John or Ash, I'm not sure if you, what you'd like to say about that. That's fine. Sorry, John, did you want to cover that one? Yes, absolutely. So, um, so from a, a licensing point of view, um, we, we have a, um, uh, the ability to cover the, the software uh, operating system license and um, um, the support, as, as you did discuss. Uh, we also then back off to IBM for onward support. So if you have um, operating system issues, then, then we can uh, work with you to get those results. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I think we've reached close to the uh, the top of the hour. How are we doing, uh, Janine? Um, well, we are out of time for today, but um, we have so many terrific questions. So please know that we will answer your questions via email. Um, sadly, uh, we've run out of time, but I also want to just put up the slide for a moment. If you're interested, there we are, in more information or perhaps a demo of some of the things you've seen here, click on these links now before we disconnect. They will open um, into a separate window and you can check it out following the webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. especially want to thank Ash, Tom, and John for sharing their expertise with us. Um, later this week, watch for a follow-up email. It will contain a link to the recording of today's webinar. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for your questions. Have a great day and stay well. Thank you, Janine. Thank you.